And good afternoon and welcome in to the Smite Pro League. We're at the tail end of week eight now. It's Sunday and Gormize is going to be joining me on the desk to break down today's games and action. Go honestly, every single day, I think a lot of us just walk in the, go with what, what the games we've got today because all of them are going to be great. Yeah, I mean, it's never this state of, oh, well, man, we have to, like, even at the beginning, it's like, man, well, Obey's not going to be doing too well. Now it's just like, okay, well, Obey just got a 2-0 over United. You've got United in, in the state where after they dropped Ionic and picked up Genetics, they've started to skyrocket. Literally every team, it, it feels like, is neck and neck, even though the standings might be a little separated. I mean, first through seventh, they're still just a few games apart. Yeah, it seems to be the case, and let's have a little look through exactly how things are breaking down here. First of all, here's a little look at the schedule that we're going to be looking at today. So far, we saw Friday and Saturday's action, but now we're on to Sunday with E-United up against Sanguine. These two teams met off in week number four, where Sanguine won 2-1, and it was actually Genetics' first game in the Pro League for E-United then. So we get to see if any adjustments have been made from E-United in that set. And then, at the end of the day, we get to see Space Station Gaming go up against Obey and as you can see in the standings Obey still have a shot to make the playoffs if they win out their games and look for results elsewhere but with this United game at the top of the shop against Sanguine I think that's going to be an important one to see exactly how this one breaks down first of all because if United find the win it makes it a lot trickier for Obey to try and qualify for the playoffs. Yeah, and that's the, the biggest thing. Those top two teams, which right now, it's kind of a three-way fight for one and two. Honestly, you could maybe even make it a five-way fight for number two. But specifically, those three teams and Ghost and SSG and Sanguine specifically are trying to fight their most to overcome those positions and get those top two spots because that's a buy into the playoffs, which gives them a top fourth guaranteed finishing for this phase which gives them a lot of points going into the second half of the year yeah i think the most important thing to look at with e united here today gore and how they've been playing so far really is about their consistency level they brought genetics on like we said in week three and faced off against sangren but the problem is, sorry, I should say week four. But the problem seems to be that they're really starting to struggle, honestly. They've not really found many results lately. They lost to Obey on Friday, just gone 2-0. Before that, losses to Renegades. And before that, though, they did find that one win against Radiance. So it kind of shows they can play at the high level with Radiance. But United is still clearly struggling. Yeah, and I think the, the biggest one, and is actually a lot of the highlights from this set, it was a really solid one for them, and they, they have a lot of versatility in their god picks, but they just lost 2-0 to Obey, of all people. They had some really good defenses, and again, they're, they're willing to pull out some drafts and maybe some gods that others aren't. I mean, Sidon being one of them that comes through, specifically even going into the jungle, is something that is almost wholly uniquely in E United. So they have that flexibility, but it really does come down to making it consistent that they just haven't been able to do. Completely agree. I think a lot of it really comes down to they don't really know what their identity is supposed to be in terms of their playstyle. You can see that in their god picks and bans. Not a whole lot compared to the rest of the league. No one in double digits have been picked up consistently, so they're varying their god pool a lot. Good news is, though, we got a chance to sit down with Cardiac early on, the coach of United, to see how he's feeling about today's games. So we're here with Cardiac, the coach for E United. And, you know, there's a lot that's been going on with the SBL, a lot of these teams on the rise, e United being one of them. But, you know, we don't get to talk to the coaches too often. So I, I kind of want to start this one off with, you know, just coaching in the SBL in general. Now that we're in the later weeks, what exactly does your mind focus on? Like, where is the goals? What is the next step for e United? Where does your mind go? I think we take each match one step at a time. Um, we analyze each opponent that we go against, and when we have double weeks like we did this week, it gets a little bit harder, but we take the, the day in between to just, you know, watch the sets and really look at their picks and bands, see how they're playing the map, anything we can exploit, um, things like that. That's actually, you know, something I got to talk about a little bit last week in one of the interviews, but, you know, the, the double header, having two games, sometimes teams play them you know, Friday, Saturday, or Saturday, Sunday, but you guys have yeah. the kind of gap in there, the Friday, Sunday bridge. Is it awkward to have that one day? Like, does it feel maybe crammed all in that one day in between to just try and get prepped for the next set? Um, It's not super crammed. I mean, at the beginning of the week, we usually 
we take into uh, account that we're going to be playing two sets. So we kind of have that mindset going in. And um, we take that day in between to usually scrim, do some bot review, and just prep. And it doesn't really feel super crammed. No. Well, that's always nice to know because, well, as you mentioned, you did have two this week, and the one that you're going to be playing today is Sanguine. And they're kind of bouncing back. The last time I got to talk to them, I think going into last week, they were a little bit on a losing streak, a few weeks without a win. And now they're starting to kind of re-solidify themselves. So how do you prepare for a team that they seem predictable while at the same time having something new every single time they play? Yeah, Sanguine's a really good team. They tend to take games into the late game and really look for those team fights. Um, and they're really good at that. Um, we have a lot of picks that are similar, but we also have some picks that are different. So I think um, we're going to be pretty strong going into the pick and ban phase. Um, and yeah, I just think that looking back at the games from last time, there's a lot that we learned and we're going to take that forward. I know I'm excited to see it. I'm sure everyone in chat is excited to see it as well. E United versus Sanguine. Thanks for stopping by, man, and, and giving me a chat to be able to come through. But good luck in the games, and I hope things go well. Yeah, thanks. Little conversation there with Cardiac Coach of E United. As you can see, the, the real game plan, I think, is pick some bands for them to try and nullify some of what Sanguine can bring. And in fairness, I think that's one thing that teams haven't really looked to do too much is try and nullify them in the pick some band stage. So I'm excited to see if E United can do it. Gormizer, I mean, especially with E United losing against Obey earlier on on Friday, it kind of gives me a feel that they probably prepared for this one a little bit more, expecting Obey to be a little bit simpler for them overall. Yeah, that's kind of the, the feel I'm getting. And I think it's easy to do. I mean, Obey, their eighth place, a lot of teams, it, probably the easiest ones to look over more than anything. And so you think, man, you know, we're going up against Sanguine. Sanguine's up there fighting for the top. That's who I would be studying for as well. It's the same thing if you're looking at your exams and you're like, man, I have a C in <laughs> physics and I'm going to fail if I do not pass this versus coasting at like a 98 in whatever other class you happen to be going into English, for an example. So it is study for Sanguine, and admittedly it's because a lot of it, you know, theoretically seems simpler. They go to the same gods most of the time, so maybe trying to draft over them in picks and bands is pretty easy to do. But the biggest thing that stands out to me, and this is something that's been consistent for weeks now, but Shincho is the kill leader in the SBL. I think yep. I've gotten to say that every week since like week two or week three, and the gap between him and the next highest just keeps growing. I think right now it's 23 kills behind it is Sam for soccer. It's 133 yeah. going into this week for Jess Shinto, and then Sam was at 110. So it's probably changed with the last couple of days, but I mean, the guy personifies Merlin when he plays him. It's just so ridiculous to see how well he's been able to hold up mid. Yeah, completely agree. And I think United definitely there. I mean, their top killer is around 80 kills, I want to say, which is Scream. But it's also the most deaths on the team. A lot of it is really coming through Scream for United. Whereas Sanguine, on the other hand, I, I, I want to see what happens in this one specifically for him, for me. Because earlier on, you know, a couple of weeks ago, they lost that big game against SSG. And then not only did they lose against SSG, they then went on straight away to be Ghost, but then lost to Obey. So Sanguine have kind of been all over the place. Maybe teams are starting to work them out a little bit more here. And I think that's really what it is, is, I mean, we even had it, I think it was Nika who said it best, and it was in his, uh, one of the post-game interviews, and it's just that they are a meta team, they tend to play meta picks, and so if you can strip those away from them, it starts to trip them up a little bit. We've seen them gravitate away from the Horus, but the Horus was a huge, you know, cornerstone of Sanguine's entire strategy for the first few weeks the jing wei i mean it's become a meme because of how often we see it and granted <laughs> there's something to be said about consistency being key here for sanguine but if they get those power picks taken away what they fall back on is maybe more revealing as to how well they can play and hold up here in the sbl well, we did get a chance to sit down with Jakor from sanguine and have a little chat to him about how things are going on the team and what he had to say about this set all right, we're here with Yarkor, the solo laner for Sanguine. And the last time I got to talk to Sanguine, there was a bit of a losing streak going on. So I, I just want to know, how did you turn things around? I mean, what did the team do to, to kind of stop that and, and get these wins? Uh, after the, I think it was like the space station set, I believe. Mm -hmm. We just sit with each other, uh, like just talk about it, what is going on, what we could do, what we need to do. Uh, and we use like thing we figure things out 
and then we like play rival and i think that in that set like every single one of us did what they need to do and that is why we came on top on that set so we 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 were losing like we were in a i think three games lose streak mm -hmm. then we like turning back so yeah i think you we mainly just talk about it and just change what we need to change well, and it seems like it worked pretty well for you. You had a solid win against the Renegades, and now you're going up against E United, who is the only other team besides yourselves that have lost to Obey. So what do you expect to see out of E United today? I think they, they have like a different way to like play the game. The way they approach it, the way they want to play is different. So uh, I think they respect not like the normal is my meta. I expect like different peaks and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I think that we are like kind of ready to to see what the game gonna bring us. I know I'm excited. And, and just to get your thoughts before this one, if you had to predict the score, you guys taking it to zero, you win in two one. How close do you think this set's gonna be? I think it's gonna be like a two one for us. A 2-1. Close fought win. Either way, it's going to be an interesting one to yeah. watch. I mean, yeah. I, I, I know I'm excited for it. I'm pretty sure everybody else is going to be as well. Good luck in your games, and vamos sanguin. Yeah, thanks. Man, I, I hate all the safety gore that we see out of these, like, interviews. Everyone going, yeah, it's going to be 2-1s, you know? It's such an easy thing to go, yeah, we'll give them a game, you know? We don't look so bad <laughs> if it goes 2-1 then, and we give them a set. Why can't teams just go, yeah, we're going to stomp them 2-0, you know? We're going to give them well, a good hide in, send them packing. <laughs> I think it, it, it is kind of that built-in safety net, because the minute, I, I feel like so many teams, the minute they say, yeah, we're going to 2-0, they lose the first game, and then... Sometimes they bounce back and they take the second two games like it's nothing, but they always have that, like, scorch mark that would be that one loss. So they play it safe. And I think, honestly, with the way the league is right now, it might be easier to play it safe. Like, I think trying to take a bet that someone's going to win 2-0 at all, it seems like it's a risk that it might not be worth taking. Yeah, but at the same time, if you get it right, you look great, right? Like, take the True. risk, reap the reward, so to speak. Let's get into pick some bands, though. See how this one plays out between the two. E United did mention, Cardi, there in the interview, that they focus on their picks and bands. So I'm excited to see where they go with this, this option, and if they do come out ahead in the draft. Well, there's so many things that... Again, that, that feel maybe uniquely e United. The e United pull out the most. I mean, they're the only team that has, well, Terra, that has Baron Samadhi in their top five picks. So they like to gravitate towards things that can give them control, maybe give them some sustain. But again, there's a lot of this that maybe is, can you play like yourselves while still keeping Sanguine tripped up? Can you maybe get rid of that Merlin to make them a little uncomfortable in the mid lane and force Shinto to play something else? But you also have to be wary of his right. And like, there's just so much that they can go down on Sanguine that feels comfortable. I want to know, you know, how they're going to approach this tact tactily. Okay, well, looking at the band so far, Jingwei, King Arthur taken away by United. That's two bands. One focus was Jokor, who's played a lot of King Arthur so far this season. Eight games under his belt, one of his highest most picks. And Jingwei from Netroid. And now they're going to join up with the whole Yi. So for the first time, I feel like almost this year, Netroid is going to have to pick a different hunter than Ho Yi or Jingwei. <laughs> oh, the... the... Bad news, I would argue, for Sanguine, or actually for United here, depending on what they grab first. Wool is still available, and Wool can bring a lot and has been maybe one of the higher prioritized hunters in the league. Just in terms of bans, I think he's been falling off a little bit, especially now that Rom is kind of in that conversation to be able to come up. But it is, you know, what kind of pressure can we do to control Netrioid? And right now, I, I don't know what his Rom looks like. I don't know what his Ula looks like because it's been so long since I've seen either of them. But I'm assuming he has something in the pocket. Well, no real surprise to see Merlin picked up early on in the draft. One of the most potent mid laners for the most part, but not just in the league. In the hands of mid laner there as well. Shinto has played fantastically so far on that. It doesn't surprise me to see United strip that away. So I'm going to answer back with the Yemoja pickup for Rongyu early on here. As well as the Horus ban that we saw in the ban phase from Sanguine, trying to limit some of the genetics god pool. But look at this, the Kernanos hover coming out from Sanguine now. Now that would be interesting. I think, you know, I mean, of all the, the gods that have gotten a buff in this patch, 
It's very easy to talk about Rom because he got so many, but Kernanos yeah. did get a little bit of a buff there, just affecting, I, I can't remember if it was magical protection or magical power coming into it, but a, a little protection, bit in the seasons. Yeah. And, you know, being able to strip those protections yeah, is spirit. incredibly important, I would argue, for Netroid, the playstyle that Sanguine brings as well. But it also is something that not a lot of gods can bring. I mean, a huge team fight, Polymorph, a good amount of lockdown. He's not necessarily the go-to hunter, but there's not a lot bad about him. He can clear wave fine, he can disengage fine, and he affects your teammates or team fights pretty well as well. Yeah, I mean, it's the autumn, the Shifters of Seasons, the first ability on Kodanos, yes. it's that autumn stance that now shreds magical and physical protections. So, to make use of that, you really need some good magical damage, honestly, to really power that up. However, United here, Baron Samity, which is definitely flexible with this Terra pick, solo and support. I will say, knowing that the, the varieties on a United, we're leaning towards <laughs> this Baron going towards the solo lane here. But I'm a Tarasu now being selected Gore. It could put the cat amongst the pigeons to an extent and keep that flexible with Terror and Baron Samadhi a little bit more because of how those matchups play out, I feel. Yeah, I think it's going to be difficult for him to maybe find any progress early on. But Variety and Ian United, and honestly, most of the Baron Samadhi's that we've seen picked up, they're not really looking for the lane phase. They're not looking for the first 15 minutes of the game, even. They're waiting for the rotations they make and fighting him, Mojo. Because once that Rivers Rebuke comes through, you can pull her out of it, you can pull the team out of it. And so you can take what is a separated team fight, either locking you down or letting them escape, and kind of turn it on its head, which is where Ian United have actually been able to shine maybe better than some other teams because of that pick. I like the hell ban away from Shinto again in the mid lane against Sanguine here. Wouldn't mind seeing a Thor ban here from a United too. We've seen a lot from Paddy Tom in the jungle on this Thor before. Although they could leave it up for themselves to go towards Scream in the jungle, they just don't have the counter ban option. Obviously, they don't get the first pick after the counter ban phase, so it might be a bit trickier. It's going to be Discordia instead, so they're still focusing in on the two carries, the mid laner and the Hunter from Sanguine in this banning phase. Now, you mentioned the Thor, which absolutely screams a win for Sanguine in my eyes because so much has been done by Panatom in the jungle on this. It's been one of the strongest carries, I think, for Sanguine, period. I mean, you could put the rest of them on something they're uncomfortable on, put them all behind, two levels down, no kills to their names, and still this Thor will make an impact as they transition into that team fight phase. So I think it's something to be worried about. I also... Don't know if you hear it in the background, but I think I hear Raijin still calling out to me. I mean, it's interesting Good to point. see that yeah. he has kind of glanced over, you know, the Aphrodite, the Hell have been very potent. Discordia to a certain amount, but I mean, I think both mid laners here could do well with a Raijin. Yeah, I think it's definitely a conversation of Raijin versus Discordia there as Rama locked in for Snoopy, by the way. That is Snoopy on a United, so if you do remember Rama, he was fantastic in Snoopy's hands before. Yeah. Mercury as well now picked up. Going back to that, the Discordia situation, maybe it's because they've got so many people that are going to stay at distance. You know, Baron's going to be in the back line a little bit alongside Rama and Merlin. There's more chance of Discordia causing problems there than maybe the Raijin. But now Raijin's damage output could come into play. It's definitely a back and forth. But I do think United are so pretty well in the, the picks and bans, to be honest. Yeah, there feels like a lot of late game carry potential on a United. A lot of that is swayed with Mercury. I mean, you know, the one punch man himself being able to come through. I think it's going to be very difficult to try and lock down members of Sanguine, though, which is going to be the biggest thing. Sonic Boom can come through and maybe hit the beads for them, but then special delivery to follow up. They can dash away. I mean, Kernanos has a dash, Amaterasu has a dash, Thor has the hammer, Raijin has a dash, and Yamoja can just heal everyone up. So there's a lot of good disengage from Sanguine. Well, I think United's draft was favorable, but can they take down Sanguine in game one? Let's find out. Thanks, Hindu man. It's Finch and Mifflin here as we move into game number one between Sanguine and E United. Sanguine back on the uptick and E United struggling a bit as of late. But are some signature picks perhaps the cure here for this E United team? Only time will tell. Mif, what's what's catching your eye here at the start of this match? I'm just excited that a team finally decides to put some respect on Sanguine's name. Shinto gets the Merlin taken away. Hu Yi and Jingwei get banned out, so they get the favorable matchup in that long lane as well. The first time we've seen Netri on a god that isn't Hachiman, Jingwei, or Hu Yi, and he decides to go to CERN, that's interesting. But United said that they decided that they wanted to win in P's and B's. This is them putting as much pressure on a Sanguine as they possibly could in P's and B's. Whether or not it pans out, is to be seen. Shinto still gets his fallback pick inside of Raijin. Yarkor and Panatom still get their signature picks as well. Maybe they haven't done enough yet. 
I don't know if they necessarily have with this picks and ban phase, Mifflin. I'm right there with you. I mean, I think that United definitely got some great stuff. The Merlin from Shinto is always going to be a big deal. Snoopy on ROM. We've seen the strength that he has nowadays. That's pretty powerful, too. But I think we also saw some weaknesses. Cyclone Spin got a bit bullied on this pick yesterday. They lost a lot of left side map pressure. That was, though, when the Hunter ROM was paired with a low pressure jungler. I feel like with Scream on this Mercury, there's a good chance they should be able to do a little bit more combating early and maybe not get his walk though. And this Mercury has fantastic kill potential in a certain... The, the ultimate is going to be so impactful in this lane. Just walk through your tower. Oh, hey, look at that. CERN has to be in that lane. It's where he gets his farm. Let me just slam him real quick. Worst case, I get his beads. Best case, I take his life. I mean, there's a lot of counter potential there. But I'm worried about Panatom on this Thor. Snoopy on Rom is completely open towards any sorts of ganks that way. Yes, you have the ultimate to maybe buy yourself a little bit of time. But when you're landing, you're going to be landing into a big pig out of CERN. You're going to be landing into Berserker's Barrage. You have follow-up stuns from this Yamoja that's just going to be able to blow you up. You're so predictable in the air. I'm worried about Snoopy in this lane. It could potentially be trouble for him, man, if Panatom makes Snoopy the target. As I said, that's already something that we've noticed is a bit of a vulnerability for Rom early, is that even with some of that increased ability to clear Wave, it's not as if a whole lot's been done to his ability to sort of help you contest buffs and that sort of thing. So he can sometimes lose some pressure in this left-hand side. We'll certainly see where Panatom seems to go. If I'm on Sanguine, though, I kind of want him with Shinto at all times, Mifflin. I feel like that duo right now is one of the best two-player combinations in the whole league. I mean, when your mid laner is the killingest player in the league, it's not going to be just contingent on him. Yes, Shinto is phenomenal, but it's that core 3v3 that Sanguine has that they always play through in the early game. It really works them through. They finagle their way into the mid to late, and then we see the five-man stack. Panatom is hugely impactful for the early game. It's the only person on Sanguine that's consistently looking for fights, consistently looking to make sure that United or any team that they do decide to play against is not able to just run away with the early. And giving them Thor, one of the best early game junglers with global pressure, that, that could be pretty rough spelling for United. It's going to be difficult making sure they slow him down. It always is when you're up against Thor. So we got to trust E United had some kind of plan to go alongside it. Another big thing for me that I think that's going to be worth following is how Variety plays this Baron. I think we started to see a trend now lately with some of these movement speed warriors over in Solo of our Solo laners getting involved a bit more early often. And Variety is one of those players that likes to do it, man. His Baron can be really difficult to deal with in these team fights, but he's up against an Ama. I mean, is he really going to be able to match all that extra presence that your core could eventually provide. Normally when you see the Baron pick up, it's because there's a Yamoja on the other team and there's a really close range immobile warrior in your lane. Amaterasu is not immobile. She's got movement speed in the kit. She's got the dash to close distance. Variety's gonna have a much harder time than when he plays something against like Osiris or something like that. Ama can close the gap or she can rotate early and try and leverage an early lead. Being a warrior, he's gonna be much more impactful in these mid to late, uh, early game fights. Could be big if potentially Arcor is able to somewhat outclass Variety. We saw the red buff invaded just now as well by Sanguine, and that was part of your concern, right? Was that there would be a bit of a lack of pressure on this left-hand side of the map, kind of in general. And not necessarily up to Snoopy so much, right, on this ROM pick. It's more that that with this Thor, with that threat of all this Raijin damage and the lockdown from Rongyu on the Emoja, it's a bit tougher for United to sort of safely step in and contest at this point. So Sanguine... I think doing the right thing, trying to press some of that aggression here in the early. Shinto, it's so deceptive how Shinto decides to play the game, but oh, good luck. That miss, we, we disengage. <laughs> uh, I said oh, earlier, no. the worst case scenario, you get the beads. Uh, worst case scenario, you just whiff. It's okay, bud. Try again in about a minute. Shinto already cool, has though, right? a level like... lead. Yo, clap, I'm in. Yeah, he looks sick. <laughs> but you were talking about Shinto. I'd love to hear, hear this point still, certainly. Oh, oh, yeah. Shito's already got a level lead in this early game. Nothing really has happened. He just farms so incredibly aggressively. He's constantly moving towards these back camps. He's clearing out mid camps alone. Panatom's comfortable just looking for his standard buffs, and he's giving up a lot of that neutral farm because he knows he wants to play through Shinto. Already, he's able to get a lead, start to force out Hurry when leverage that artillery strike long-range damage that Raijin has. Scream can't really contest this pick in mid because... 
Raijin honestly could 2v1 or 1v1 anyone that walks his way, and it's only going to get worse as his damage starts to come online. It looks like it might be a Spear of Deso first. That means Sanguine might be shifting towards that slightly earlier game focus that we started to see in weeks 5 and 6, where they look for fights and try and force objectives. Yeah, I wonder if Shinto being a bit greedy with the farm as the red buff invade comes out. Wrong Yu on the wrong side of this wall, but Riptide allows him to escape. Panatom in the air, but he's alone for this dive. Dunks down anyway, still has the hammer. If he needs that to escape, I believe, as Shinto tries to clean up Scream, just not enough damage. A lot committed by Sangwon for this red buff invade. They don't even get it, but now maybe they can get genetics. The wild hunt brought him down low. Thunder Crash interrupts the dash, and Netroid comes out on top. Shinto just catching it out so instantly. Oh, you're going towards that Terra 3, huh? All right, well, I guess maybe I jump there too. Oh, well, it works out just fine. And this constant aggression from Sanguine is afforded to them because of the early lead that Shinto has. If they're even or behind, there's no way Shinto decides to go in. Hey, worst case scenario, you got the beads. <laughs> just as you were saying. Yeah, that's pretty good. Scream. You can be able to do it again if he so chooses. Maybe even tries to shift back towards that long lane and alleviate some of the pressure. But look at Yarkor already in the game. He's trying to get a bit more. Getting involved earlier on is the Amaterasu. That's the beads out from Hurwin. Wrong Yu, though, pays for the aggression from Sanguine. He's the one that gets clipped by Genetics as the United find their first kill here of the game. Sanguine! Getting aggressive here in the middle lane and getting a bit punished. This game a bit more back and forth than you might have expected with the way that Sengwen stepped on the gas out of the gates. But United, not going to just give up all this farm for free. Rongyu moves up so far there. What is he looking for? His ultimate wasn't available. He's a long-range mage at this point in the game that's looking for stuns from a distance. That frontline potential isn't really there. Sanguine, even if they do take the fight, they get a fantastic initiation from Rongyu, the entirety of United's already inside their Tier 1 tower. There's not much that you could do there regardless. It's just a bit of a misplay, playing a little bit too far forward, maybe feeling themselves off the tail end of a pretty nice engagement. But... Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Only about a thousand gold differential right now in favor of Sanguine. I I'm sure they're absolutely fine waiting for the late game, especially considering that their team really lends itself well towards that mid to late. The objective burn that Yarkor is going to afford with this passive, the the huge amount of damage that Shinto is going to get online the second he finishes out some of this pen. Divine Ruin, the first item picked up, going to be able to counteract some of that life steal and healing that Variety brings. Things are rough, Speaking and they're on a timer. Of variety. Yeah, not bad. He's going to be in the ground. Panatom gets the second kill here for Sanguine as this Thor really is the one setting the pace throughout this early game here so far. And you mentioned earlier about Shinto's lead. I don't think he was just kind of magically generating that. For the first six minutes or so in the game, Panatom was behind Scream in terms of that experience farmed. But Panatom, by being active, I think makes it a worthwhile trade. Let Shinto farm up some of that stuff, perhaps without him in the jungle, and trust Panatom to actively find that farm elsewhere elsewhere through these ganks. It's a risky strategy putting your jungler behind on purpose, uh, especially considering that ganks are never confirmed. Unless you're dunking no. onto a Baron Somdi who's largely immobile and you have an Ama backing you up, then maybe it is a little bit confirmed, but that's a lot of trust you have to put into your teammates. Panatom says, okay, I'll fall behind early. Don't worry though, I'm gonna just kill him. That doesn't work every <laughs> single time. Sanguine, so much trust in each other, and that comes with the years of practice they have together. Four, five years this squad have been playing ranked, they've been playing casuals, they've been playing competitively as a unit, and it's starting to show. Constantly, man. These guys are grinders when it comes to Smite. I mean, all these SPL players are, obviously, but... Sanguine, it feels like <laughs> it's almost all they do. I mean, you hear all the time, anyone with Sanguine players in their friends lists, man, you see them constantly logged into this game and putting in work, so you love that for them. I mean, obviously, we're at a point where everyone in the SPL competes, but I think these Sanguine guys, they do seem to bring a little more. I mean, certainly me and you have got some late night queues together where we just line up against five members of Sanguine and just F6 at 10 minutes immediately. I'm checked out the second I see their names. Why on the are they in this screen. assault queue? It doesn't add up, man. I don't. Okay, <laughs> here they are. You have SPL tomorrow. What are you doing, bro? But they're, they're grinding and it's been working out for them. Right now, the aggression is starting to pan out. They're slowly trying to shift their focus back towards farming. They've already got the beneficiary of a er fantastic early game. And if they continue to farm up, get their second relics online. That's when they're going to start to move towards these objectives.
Scream starts the fight off with the Sonic Boom, but River's Rebuke cuts off his escape path, and he's suddenly stuck in this engagement. Great damage on a wrong you, but Panatom finds the dunk. That makes it one for one. Scream for the Emoja. If the fight ends here, Sanguine's happy with it. They've already got the better trade, but these guys are hungry. They want a bit more. Good damage on a Hurwin. Forces out his beads. Tycho drums. Hit from max range, and Hurwin falls as well. Sanguine find the two for one in the jungle. I thought banning out or taking away Merlin would be enough to slow Shinto down, but it's constant aggression, dashing forward, finding these long-range ultimates. He's been absolutely dominant out of the center of the map. And look, he's not done yet. Red buff, yeah, that's mine. Genetics is health bar, yeah, that's mine. Shinto is on an absolute tear. He is now level 12, highest in the map in terms of that XP farm. And I don't know whose job it is to step up and tell him to slow down, because I would not want to move up on this Raijin here at this point. He's in such a great spot, and Panatom, really the way that Seng would play, I'm going to get back to the Panatom in just a second, they play with so much trust, man. Rongyu was in a really tough spot there after using that River's Rebuke and essentially locking himself in with Scream, but he gets enough time bought for him by that Panatom dunk to turn that fight back around. I love watching these Sanguine guys play because they really do play as five members using 20 abilities as opposed to maybe one or two guys trying to make the most out of their own. Yeah, we might as well remove the nameplates and just replace it all with Sanguine because they are a cohesive unit. They play together so incredibly well. And the trade in that engagement, fantastic. Rongyu dies, who cares? We got Scream and Hurryuin. I'll trade my support's yeah. life for free half the time, let alone getting something in return. <laughs> Panatom's de dunk turns the fight almost entirely. Wrong, you trust his squad. And I think that really is the name of the game for Sanguine. It's this insane amount of trust they have in each other. Whew, nothing beats pure mechanical skill, though, as Snoopy has so far hit every shot. Misses the second and third, though, so can't clean up the kill. Has done enough work, but look at Scream. He got caught out by Panatom, took a ton of damage. Panatom goes up to the sky, but he's so low. I can't see a world where he dunks back in. Both squads get a member low, but cannot afford to commit to find the kill. Scream also gets to maintain his ultimate there, so the global pressure is on the side of United. And Scream's been having a good game so far. I've really only seen him miss one ultimate, and every single time he's burning out beads. He's taken Shinto's yeah. beads twice. He's taken out Netroid's beads once, but so far, United hasn't had the continued aggression on the back of it. They take out the beads, and then they go somewhere else and look for a fight. Might as well continue Well, who's the, the next pressure. guy in after Scream? Like, it's just him, it feels like. It, it really does. There's no follow-up. It's because Genetics has been locked into this long lane for so long that really he can't follow up in mid. Scream's gonna have to do it himself, I guess, if he wants to. <laughs> he gets the crit online. Potential comes up eventually, but that's not the best place to be, one versus five. Variety walks in and can say goodbye to about 40% of the health bar. Good wall there from Genetics. Makes life way harder on Rongyu, who is forced to stick around. Uses the ultimate to cut off the engage path for E-United, so that'll be the fight slowing down, especially with Genetics' is big time ult there. I don't think Sanguine won any more of that, so Sanguine fully back off afterwards, and E-United can't quite lock wrong you down. Net win for Sanguine there. Yes, you trade out more of your ultimates, but they make it out alive when they really didn't have any right to. The Genetics wall there separates the team fight completely, almost gets Rongyu killed by his positioning instantly. Yeah. And then Sanguine all drop their ultimates, say, well, none of us are going down here, and they back up safely, and they don't trade anything on the tail end of it. Gold Fury doesn't get pulled, no engagement further on. They know that they can't win the fight because, as you pointed out, Genetics Ultimate was available, as was Snoopy's, as was Scream's. So they just reset and keep their lead going. Now, 2,000 gold, and they can wait until their ults are back up, wait until they get some relics online, and try again around that Gold Fury. You know, Hindu likes to give me a hard time because if we ever, like, queue games together, I abandon him to die all the time. Well, Sanguine, they don't roll that way, man. If someone on the squad's in trouble, then everyone, it feels like, turns back around to help. So as you mentioned, great ultimate usage and everyone able to make it back out of there. Sanguine's still on top in this game by about 2,000. Still have the experience lead in a pretty major way in the middle lane to a three-level lead or so for Holy. Shinto. So this is certainly still the shit being driven by them. Some damage does come back their way. Sanguine forced Herwin to back and are grouping up for this next red buff invade. I, I don't know how you're going to engage on a Sh Shinto. It's got to be Scream's ultimate again. <laughs> Well, that's what did it. Shinto is already gone. Heroin gets the kill credit for it. Wrong you. Pulled back into the snipes by Variety. Good teamwork between him and Snoopy. And suddenly a two for zero has materialized out of thin air. And everything good for United has started on the back of a great sonic boom for Scream. 
Uh, Scream's really been the only playmaker this game, constantly looking for aggression, and he found the priority target. If it's Terra moving up to try and stop Shinto, yeah, he's five levels up on Genetics. His Genetics health bar it might as well not exist if Shinto is looking at him, so Scream aptly picks the right target, finds the instant kill. The follow-up from his squad is perfect, and they get a Gold Fear on the tail end of it. Uh, this game was looking like Sanguine was going to run away with it, but United cut the lead to nearly... Only 1,000. They're back in it, and their late game is incredibly potent. United, that is. They have this Mercury who's going to come online in a big way. The, we have this Merlin who's always going to be dealing damage, but even more so in the late games. We know that Rom has always been one of the best late game hunters. Terra is going to have fantastic engage and counter engagement potential. Sanguine really do need Panatom to start stepping up again like he was in the first eight minutes and find the engagements like Scream has been. That was the difference maker for them, wasn't it? It was these Thor dunks really making life hard on E-United. We saw the gank in long, then all the way over to the gank in right, and it kind of spread out their defenses. But Variety has started rotating into more of these fights. I think his impact has been pretty big here, too. We were wondering which one of these solo laners would do more. It turned out they both did a lot, just at different times. It was Yarkor getting involved there first, but these last few fights, Variety has provided that extra bit. We're asking, what's the follow-up going to be off the back of that sonic boom? Who's the next guy in to make use of those beads being down. Well, now the variety is here. I feel like it's going to be him in a lot of these cases. And the follow-up is so good from Roddy. The second we see him use Lord of the Afterlife, Yarkor instantly responds by using his own ultimate to try and suck up that stun. But that means your huge engage potential in his Ama ult? Yeah, it's gone. Variety doesn't really mind. The rest of his team has potential to engage on their own. So trading out his ultimate for Amos is almost always going to be pretty high value. Anything that I'd have to worry about that dazzling offensive in a fight feels pretty good that I'd have to think on the side of e United. But these last few fights have, as you sort of mentioned, you know, brought back my trust in this e United squad here in this mid game. It was starting to feel like Sanguine had all this momentum. They had such a big lead in the middle lane that has started to shrink a bit. Even Panatom was a bit ahead in the jungle, but that's been brought back closer to parity now as Variety should be able to force down the tier one in right. With, with the Fury down and with Pyromancer down, Sanguine did get that in trade for that Fury that e United got a moment ago. I, I expect things to be a bit quiet for a little while. This gives time for e United to farm back up Myth and, and try and make sure they're ready for this next Sanguine skirmish. I, I certainly hope it's not quiet. Take a peek at Panatom's build. He's going more Bruiser-centric. The Anchile comes out. He's going to get a, a little bit of power, 50 power, and the magic defense online. But that means he knows that he's going to be the initiator for these fights. He's trying to get a little bit of tankiness online so he can dunk in first, survive the initial wave of damage from United, and then potentially look for more or disengage and let the rest of his team move in. So with this Bruiser build on a god like Thor that is already going to fall off a little bit towards the late game, he's trying to get involved quickly and efficiently in the early to mid, and he's got to constantly do it. This build is going to fall off even harder than it had he just chose to go for Heartseeker, had he chose for Arendite. Something along those lines is going to help him boost his damage towards the late game. Now he's completely contingent on this mid. So perhaps there is a bit of a ticking clock there for him. I like the idea from Panatom. We've seen from Scream that his engage is mostly going to be focused on Tashinto. That means that a lot of the damage, Variety and Hurrowind, is going to be coming Panatom's way, right? He might not have to worry so much about directly Scream if the fights keep going the way they have. So the Ankele in this spot feels pretty good, plus the CDR in a world where you went Brawlers early on does not hurt. So not bad from Panatom. He's going to have to capitalize, though, on the spike that he's getting right now, where it could potentially hurt him later on in this game. He's not the only member, though, who we talked about their early game relevance. We might have to see a bit more from them coming out later on here, I feel like, in this game. Hurlwind, after some of that early pressure from Panatom, has largely gone unchecked, I feel like, these last few minutes. He is only getting scary. And he's closing the gap so quickly. What was a 3-4 level lead now cut to 1, maybe 2 in favor of Shinto. But Shinto already yeah. has the Soul Reaver online. Oh, never mind. Hurry Wind does the same. A lot of parity between these mid laners. But the damage output from both is incredibly high. Single target damage, Shinto should win across the board because Hurry Wind is looking for these ice stance abilities. He's looking to drop huge AoE abilities in the back of these team fights. If anyone steps up to Shinto in a 1v1 engagement, the blow-up should be in favor of Sanguine. Ultimate was charged there from Scream, but 
He doesn't find a target on that left-hand side. Without too much of a surprise, though, there really wasn't going to be a big fight until there was something to fight over. And now, with the Fury respawning in 10 seconds and the Pyromancer coming up at that same timer, we should be seeing a little bit more action happening. This is where we'll get to see just how well Panatom can capitalize off some of this extra protections in this next skirmish. The 5v5 stack, the home of Sanguine, is starting to group up around this Oni Fury. Already, we see Scream decide to try and push out that long lane, get themselves some pressure, and United are the first one at gold. Sanguine have fantastic engaged potential. Maybe they're comfortable letting United be the aggressor on a gold Fury so that they can immediately dive into the back line. Sanguine might have been a bit late setting up here, Myth. Look how much of the vision is controlled by E United. A sentry ward in the pit, and yeah, Doug's lighting up all those wards. That might be why Sanguine are a bit more tepid than E United, but that trepidation is gone. Sanguine will now start up the Oni Fury and force E United to be the one to step in. They're burning it quick. It's down well below half, so E United step on the gas. Sanguine already got it. Scream drops his ultimate early too, but Yarkor makes it out. Can't say the same for Netshua though. He's in Scream's clutches and left, and Scream will find the kill. Genetics now low, as is the Mercury, as a big wall stun for Panatom comes out, but there's just no follow-up. Shinto did not have the cooldown, so E United may have lost the objective, but now they lose Scream too. Yeah, net win for Sanguine there. The objective, trading out Netrioid for Scream is almost always going to be high value. You got to slow down this Mercury. He's looking to start to get his Rage finished up. He's maybe going to move into some more crit afterward. The slower you can get that going, the less stacks he has, the harder his transition into late game is going to be. And already we're rapidly approaching that point. 21 minutes into the game. Now Fire Giant's going to be the question mark. Pyromancer is going to be the question mark. Sanguine not willing to let it be a question mark. Going to go ahead and pull it out. But how does that fight go so well there for, for Sanguine Myth? I mean, I feel like United had it off on a great start. They hit the Sonic Boom, and Scream is all alone over there with Netroid in the back of the fight. When did Sanguine sort of get back on top? Immediately off the back of Yamoja Ultimate, separating the fight, allowing for each individual member of Sanguine to back up and refocus, re-choose their fight. Then they group up around each other, start to peek around corners, see if they can maybe look for an engagement themselves. Panatom has a fantastic wall to peel out for the rest of his squad there. And Scream just gets a little bit overzealous, goes a little bit too deep at a little bit too low health. Rongyu optimizes on it, picks up the kill. And in the entire time, Sanguine's not looking to re-engage. They're looking to safely disengage, whereas you United's kind of getting dragged further and further into Sanguine's territory. It's a clean disengage, it's a clean Gold Fury, and what could have been a little bit worse as a 1 for 0 trade is made into a 1 for 1 and the objective in favor of Sanguine. And Fire Giant now at half HP, but Sanguine decide to drop it. They allow the objective to start healing back up once E United shows some presence on this right side. I don't know if Sanguine know it though, but Snoopy was not there for that fight. He was way over in left near the Gold Fury pit. He'll back now and look to rejoin his squad. But Sanguine have given up their posturing around the Fire Giant. Netroid going to check out what's going on, on the left side of the map. Panatom is fully backed too. E United, even without Snoopy there, should have plenty of time to regroup for this next fight. In a game that's as completely even as this, I, I can't fault Sanguine for showing respect there. They also didn't have the vision on top of Snoopy because, as we established earlier, United was just dominant in wards around the Gold Fury. So Snoopy knows he can walk around that jungle and not really show too much. He has a sentry in that pit. Sanguine, only about 800 gold, maybe 1,000 gold in the lead. There's no way they want to take that coin toss on the Fire Giant. They're going to look for a pick first. They're going to look for some sort of engagement, then back up towards these objectives. 50-50s have never been the name of the game for Sanguine. This might be bad for Variety, though. Even with the life of the party, he's in trouble. Shinto, though, elects to go with the damage tick on the ultimate, not to pull him back in with the taunt. So Variety forces them to chase a bit longer than they might have liked to. Shinto does eventually get the kill, but Scream finds a pretty good sonic boom cutting through the team fight. The tower does finally go down, and now Scream is stuck in the back of the fight. Everyone on Sanguine would just turn around and look at him, and Netroid with the long-term rotation comes around the back, gets one, and sets up for the second as Yarkor takes care of genetics. Panatown now on the trace looking for Scream, forcing the beads out from him, but Sanguine's already won this fight front to back. Snoopy wasn't there at all. Sanguine grouped up his five, almost like a shark, just smelling for blood in the water. Immediately spot out a Variety, pick him off. The enemy team at United tries to regroup, try to peel him out. Not quick enough, and then two more members fall. 
maybe they should have just allowed Variety to fall there, regroup, potentially defend the Fire Giant 4 versus 5, but instead they dig their heels in deep and get stomped out for it. Snoopy was nowhere in range to help out that, with that engagement. He United have to identify that and be willing to let small losses go. Instead, they lose a Tier 1 tower, a Tier 2 tower, Fire Giant, 3 lives, and potentially a Phoenix. It's already down to half. Snoopy and Genetics are starting to show up in position, but the burn continues. United do just enough to force Sanguine back, but that's not before they've already lost this right side Phoenix. I almost wonder if how long it took them to kill Variety kind of baited E United there. You know what I mean? Like, uh, if it had been quicker, they could say, yeah, cut our loss and let Variety out. But Variety did a lot of work to kind of extend his life, and maybe that kind of misled E United into thinking it was a better fight than it was. Maybe, but even then, Variety should have the wherewithal to let his boys know, like, hey, man, no way yeah, don't I'm getting out of here. Yeah, guys, it's rough in here. The water's hot, <laughs> and they're hitting me hard. Just just get out. Uh, instead, though, he uh, maybe he's calling for help. Maybe he isn't, but United just make a slight misplay. Take a peek at Sanguine's relics. Three fully evolved shells. You think Scream's yeah. going to get value out of any of these crit auto attacks? I think not. He's going to have to burn through nine stacks of just shielding. United, though, look at this group up. That's interesting. They're looking to catch out Sanguine out unawares in their own jungle. Yeah, well, Sanguine, no, they're here. The jig is up, and Yarkor starts things off. Panatom is in the sky as well as Rongyu cuts the fight in half. Nothing with that dunk there from Panatom, but he forces Hurwin out and avoids Scream's ultimate. Meanwhile, Netroid, how about a double kill in the back as he shuts down the dual lane of E United? Now, Shinto, with a little bit of a fight with Scream on the right-hand side, forces him back out, but Sanguine have been steadily moving around the map here at this point. They can now force down this left side if they'd like, since they already got the right side and threatened both side lanes of E-Unite. Panatom might have got the most value out of a missed ultimate ever. Right! <laughs> Forcing Scream to ult a wall there means that there's no way that United can re-engage that fight. They immediately have to back up. Genetics and Snoopy both dead there. This Phoenix is dead to rights. Then Sanguine can either look to get a pick or move into these tier 1 towers in mid. Variety starts off with the life of the party. A big crit does bring Panatom down low, but the Phoenix at half health. Variety steps forward to find the heal, but they cannot protect this left side Phoenix. They just do not have enough bodies here to threaten Sanguine. They force the Phoenix down and disengage on that backside. But that's an interesting point you make about Panatom, right? I mean, he forces Heroin out without ever touching him and is able to avoid the ultimate from Scream. It's good work for a Thor who kind of didn't hit a whole lot in the fight. I would hearken to say that he hit nothing, maybe a tick of Berserker's yeah. Mirage, but he still might be the MVP of that engagement for me, which is absolutely nuts to say. Already, there's only about a minute left on this Fire Giant, two Phoenixes down on the side of United, only some Tier 1 and Tier 2 towers in mid to really stop anything that Sanguine wants to do. Pyromancer's already back alive. United doesn't really have any way to safely defend against this Fire Giant if Sanguine decides to elongate the engagement, not really go for the 50-50, and United does show face, they're going to have to worry about the Fire Minion waves contending with their Titan. They could absolutely lose to minions if Sanguine just lock United into an engagement for an extended period of time. And this is supposed to be the, the, the point in the game when United are feeling really good, right? When their Mercury has the crit online, Rage and Deathbringer are finished for him. When Heroin is, is nearly full slotted, he's getting there. Crit from Snoopy as well. But instead, they're on the back foot, man. Sanguine are getting to pick how all these engagements start. Scream has his ultimate charge, but Panatom puts a ward over the wall, sees he's there, has to use Anvil of Dawn to escape, and barely does. Still taking damage even now, but makes his way back out of there as the rest of Sanguine take care of the Tier 1. Or Tier 2. Bet I know where they're going, man. It's got to be the Fire Giant. They've got time to play with. Right side Phoenix is spawning, but that left side Phoenix is down for it so absolutely long. United show that they do have the damage to contend with Panatom, but even then, Hurrywind landed every single tick of that Void Stance. Every single ability there lands plainly into Panatom's chest, and it still wasn't enough damage to put him down. That's got to be incredibly telling and disheartening for United, knowing that this guy is tanky, he's dealing damage, he's got global pressure, and you just can't contend with it. So far, Shinto's been left uncontested in the back line as well, likely due to the fact of the triple shell pickup, meaning that even if, if Scream does find a fantastic sonic boom, his auto attacks aren't doing anything on the tail end of it for at least three seconds as he has to burn through all of those defense stacks. I mean, the, the strategy from Sanguine here is so absolutely clear. It's keep Shinto alive, let Panatom engage, and the rest will just fall in place. 
You know, we were a bit worried about how this Bruiser build would go for Panatom, but he's just been the setup man. I mean, remember that last fight? Did we know he could have a good fight and, and hit basically nothing the whole time? I mean, clearly it's working out here for Sanguine, and it's been going that way the whole game. It's about putting Netroid and Shinto into the best position to get damage out of their backline carries. The Artur, Panatom, and Rongyu are basically just bodyguards, man, for the big turrets in the backline. It has really worked up until now. And E United, it's Bunker Buster and Scream, is completely negated, as you mentioned, by those shells. It's been a really clean game here for Sanguine so far, and that's becoming more of a trend than an aberration as they want to threaten the right side Phoenix. Snoopy counters the ult by going up with his. That leaves Hurlwind as the only target. He doesn't hit anything there. A scream cuts through, but Genetics Ooh. pops in the front line. He's just not tanky enough to stand there. That's big damage from Hurlwind, yes, but Sanguine could still afford to surge forward. Snoopy has his beads forced out in the back as minions start to pour in from the left lane, but even United do push them back out and keep the right side Phoenix up. Scream dashing in a little bit overzealous, gets the, the majority of his health bar eliminated. Sanguine was already backing up, but now that Scream has to go back to base, they can re-engage on this Phoenix. He's kind of given them another wave here with which to engage, or they still have Wrong You and the Fire Giant buff, so Sanguine have plenty of sustain in the back pocket, and you can kind of see it now, can't you? It doesn't really look like they are in a big team fight anymore as they reclaim the right side Phoenix. They'll now push up the mid wave, and they've still got fire minions pushing in left, I believe, at least two more spawns. Yeah, we can see one back where the tier two used to be. So United's troubles have not ended yet. Mid Phoenix is healthy. I imagine Sanguine might even shift their focus and try and go take out the weaker one as they have fire waves moving in. But no, they're standing their ground in mid. This is a bit of a question mark. They know that Scream has to rotate over, but his ultimate's coming online soon. They have to be worried about that semi global pressure from this Mercury. This dance around the mid Phoenix should continue again. Maybe they're waiting for Panatom ultimate to come back up. That's been the main way they've been engaging every single time. And now that it's up, yep, he's up as well. They're gonna head right back in. He goes to the back line, and this time he does connect with Hurwin to force out the bead. Scream tries to get to the back line, but again is negated by those relics from Sanguine. They're able to stay alive, take care of the Mercury, and now Jarkor's turn to front line, but big damage coming from that back line. Snoopy goes up with the snipes, can't find the first, second connects, and the third isn't enough damage. Jarkor lives through it all, but as you mentioned, it's slow going on this mid Phoenix. Maybe they're making life a bit harder for themselves by not looking for the weaker one. Yarkor has teleport available. He can move back in instantly. Panatom splitting up the push. He's so tanky. He's just, just eating up these autos from Snoopy. Doesn't even care a little bit. Finds the Phoenix, loses his life. Overall valuable as it creates space for the mid Phoenix to fall as well. Wow, he basically just face tanks all those shots from Snoopy without a care in the world, able to trade his own health bar for the left side Phoenix. And that's one you'll make every time with the right side Phoenix falling earlier in mid right behind the left one. That's all three Phoenixes down, a game state. We so rarely see teams recover from in Smite Mifflin. Sanguine have looked very, very clean this game. There was a small moment towards the tail end of the early game where Scream was able to find a good fight, where it looked like United had fought their way back in. But aside from that singular engagement, it's been all Sanguine. And you know what changed after that engagement? The second that Sanguine decided that he, they weren't allowing Scream to do that again, they picked up two more shells. They leveled them both up <laughs> the second they bought it. Scream's like, all right, well, I'm going to punch nothing from now on. And no one else really on the side of United is able to peel away those defense stacks. It's really only Snoopy going for auto attacks. And so far, the aggression and damage that's been coming out of Sanguine's front line has been doing just enough to make sure that Really, the only thing Snoopy's been able to land consistently is his ultimate. That damage is nice, but the healing from Yamoja, the self-sustain from Yarkor as well, means that there's not many good targets that you could just burst down instantly if they fall low. I wonder if they are getting enough value out of this out of this Baron from them in the late game. I mean, yes, Scream isn't getting quite the value they want, but that's because Sanguine have itemized with three Spectral Arbors at this point, three shells. They are not letting Scream be the one that wins. So where's that next kind of person up for them? I mean, I think that Herwin's been putting in great damage from the back line. There's just not that second wave to get past Sanguine to those damage dealers of Shinto and Netroid. Genetics has got to step up in my mind. We haven't seen a high value ultimate from him. He hasn't found any sick counter engage or really engage himself. Every single time Panatom goes up, what does United do in response? Sonic boom. Where's Genetics at? I don't know. Not impactful the fight, to say the least. 
Well, Rongyu gets Snoopy's beads early, so that means he falls to Yarkor right away. Variety gets cut down by the Shito Netroid backline combo. Panatom dunks in onto Hurwin, who does make it back to the fountain at the very least. But Genetics just now using the ultimate. It's way too late, my man. Sanguine are the ones who take the game. 34 minutes, but it was pretty dominant the whole way. Man, Genetics dropping his ult right there. It's almost like, well, I'm about to die. My Titan's right here. Maybe he can use it. No, bud, that's not how that ability works. United has a strategy there. They try and exploit global pressure through Mercury in the early game, but they got nothing off of it. Yeah, he burned a couple beads, but never did anyone die because there were beads were down on the side of Sanguine, whereas right. what Sanguine doing, the exact same thing with Thor, except they're actually finding kills. They're finding the engagements. If United cleans up the early game a little bit, that match goes completely differently. Instead, it felt like Sanguine basically had to do exactly whatever they wanted to throughout that early game and get to the point where their backline was untouchable. A really clean game one from Sanguine. But at this point, we know United are certainly capable of bouncing back. They just got to make the adjustments in between. Before that, though, I'll get it back over to the desk and let them break it down. Welcome back to the desk after game one. United tumble in game one against Sanguine. Goldmeiser joining me on the desk once again to break down exactly what we saw there. Goldmeiser, 22 minutes in, this was a square game. And then that one pick on Variety on the right-hand side <laughs> that turned into three picks of United, turned into a fire giant. And from there, Sanguine just slowly closed the game. Yeah, and I think it was just so well played. I think the call to get three fully evolved shells against a Mercury just made it so difficult for Scream to do anything towards the late game. It made it difficult for Rom to do anything towards the late game. They seemed to recognize how much that Baron maybe could, could apply pressure early on and, and transition that into the late game. And then they picked a Materasu so Yarkor could say, yeah, none of that, please. And they just made sure Variety couldn't do anything. They made sure Scream couldn't do anything. And, I mean, even at the end, there was a Cursed Ankh picked up by Yarkor just to make sure that Genetic's ult couldn't be able to do anything for the team either. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the builds there a little bit, and sure, I don't think this is the be-all and end-all, but Genetics is built towards the end. He went Divine Ruin after the Lotus Crown. I, 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 th I don't think they did. They only had a Divine Ruin on Horrorwind already. They didn't have any frontline health, any tankiness on yeah. that frontline to engage for them with that build. That kind of limited them a little bit. But realistically, it was just a really good fight from Sanguine on the right-hand side, recognizing that Variety was just on his own a little bit too long there. And that really came back to haunt them. I mean, early on in this game, it really was square. These engagements were back and forth. The level discrepancy, the goal discrepancy, it was around even at 20 minutes in. Yeah, I kept bouncing back and forth between them. Well, the earliest note I had, realistically, was Panatom on Thor is going to be a thorn in the side of United. And there were a lot of times that that came true. And I think as they transition, not only taking a, a very good fight over there in the right-hand no. lane, as you had mentioned, but also looking at the itemization that they were going to. And I did not realize that Scream died there to the Oracle Harpy. It got credited there to wrong you, but it was trying to heal up in the process. But it's actually this guy right there, Netroid. Is where my eyes were on because spectral armors came online for saying Panatom, Brongyu, and Yarkor all had spectral. And even your jungler getting it, I think, showcases how important it was to maybe mitigate the crits so they could just ignore Snoopy half the time. I mean, we saw Panatom get a Phoenix because he just didn't care about the crits that were coming out onto him. They didn't have any, and if they did, I think they picked him up at the very end there for E United. So Netroid was able to come in and strip protections that allowed Shinto to do more damage. Wild Hunt is this giant team fight ultimate, plus that crit heavy build was just popping people from the back line because nobody was able to deal with the damage. I think that Cardinus played a huge role in that late game being as secure as it was. I am so distracted by one of your dogs in the background there, just chilling on the couch. I wish I was like that right now. <laughs> Good way to watch the Pro League, I'll tell you that much. Well, that's it for game one. It's time to move on to game two and see if United can bounce back. Because realistically, I think picks and bans again. I was really favoring what United drafted there. They just didn't play it out so well after the 20 minute mark and that's something that we've seen against sanguine time and time again they are so mm -hmm. good go at team fighting or choosing fights that they find <laughs> big wins off the back of them 
I mean, what was it Finch said? Like five, I felt like five minutes in that game. Maybe it was 10 minutes where he just goes, yeah, you could probably just get rid of the nameplates and have it say Sanguine for every member because there isn't just an individual member making plays at any point in the game for them. They feel like they always play as a unit. And even in those moments where they are isolated, it still feels like Sanguine is working together. And it is that moment of late game. They 5v fight like no other. That's the hardest part to overcome. You could predict a lot about Sanguine. You could let them have a draft that you know how to counter from top to bottom, and they could still outplay you because of their 5v5, and that's something that I think is going to have to happen here for United. We had mentioned picks and bans. That was Cardiac's focus for the team. That was United's yeah. entire focus coming into the set was how do we win around our picks and bans. Their draft was good last time. Admitted it had its own counters. They have to not only change up their draft, but now they need to adapt to Sanguine's play style and shut that down too. And I think the interesting thing is United lost that game. Loser of the game does get to choose who is first pick and second pick. United have opted with the second pick option here this time round. So I'm excited to see how they adjust. And looking at it, Merlin, Raij, and Banzerli. This time round, a little bit more focused to Shinto. If you remember in game one, they really put a lot of pressure towards the dual lane, the Netroid with the Hoi Jingwei bands. But one of those, at least so far, is going to get through. As Sanguine, Horus Aphrodite, and Kamazots again, pretty similar to game one. Yeah, normally when I see a team, you know, opt to go in for the second pick, that typically means that they're going to maybe ban something that's not necessarily a meta ban. It's something maybe more sanguine specific. And then they try to scoop up whatever meta picks they can because they know they're going to be good here. Kind of similar to what we saw Sanguine accomplish. I mean, they got their Yamoja during their first couple of picks last game when United kind of did it. It feels like they use the opposite strategy for the opposite ban side and... Well, Maybe, now Sanguine yeah. have Yarkor over there on King Arthur. I think he's going to be very happy and comfortable. More than likely, yeah. I think he's only played it nine times so far. This will be his 10th in the league at the moment. And Yarkor, well known for his King Arthur. A lot of people recognizing it. Looks like United, though, want to get a little bit more comfort for Snoopy yet again here. Going with the Jingwei instead of the Rama. And I do want to touch on the Rama. I mean, Snoopy's plays on Rama through the years have been fantastic. But he's been yeah. out of the meta for a while. The funny thing that happens with a lot of gods, I mean, there's ones that go by that hit the meta, hang around for a while, get banned for a long time, or disappear from play. Players take a bit of time to sometimes ramp on them, but people still remember how to play against them most of the time is what ends up happening there. Hebo going to be locked in, though, in response after that Ganesha. So we do get to see where this Hebo goes. More than likely, do you expect mid lane this? I don't really feel too strongly about seeing um, Panitom take this into the jungle. Yeah. I think if we're watching, uh, there's like a couple of teams that can pull him into the mid lane and, and make it worthwhile. Most of the time, I see Hebo, I think jungle. But if it's Paul, then you know, like the Knights, they're going to run it mid. Sanguine, this feels like it would fit better on Shinto. I don't know how well it would fit with Panatom's playstyle, but Shinto's playstyle is damage you immensely, get kills. Hebo fits perfectly into that mid. I mean, he's the glass cannon that comes through. He's going to have to be a little more careful. Yeah, there's no Merlin, there's no Raijin to maybe burn him down, but Hebo is, you know, just one misstep away from getting burned down at any given point in the game. So you have to be careful with where he puts that aggression. But a King Arthur, yeah. a Hu Yi, as long as they build like a good support in a jungle beside him, he can just get a lot of free damage off. Oh, that's the interesting thing. Netroid now gets that Ho Yi for himself again. That's going to be his highest pick hunter so far. This phase, I believe, is at 12 now. So doing pretty well for himself. Jingwei was just behind that at 9. Do you like the Achilles pick, though, for variety more than likely here? Against King Arthur in the laning phase, you've got a couple of options. Survive the laning phase against King Arthur, <laughs> or look to fight and go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. And Achilles is one of the best at trying to do that. I like it because it gives him that flexibility of right now, yes, he can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with King Arthur, but if they think of something that maybe they're more comfortable with later on, they can still switch him into the jungle and maybe grab another solo laner to come up and have it. And also, the thing I think is more important, Rong Yu likes playing these more supporty esque guardians. You know, the Horus comes to my mind, but we just saw the Emoja. We've seen him on Kepri in the past couple of weeks. Achilles kind of thwarts a Kepri idea from coming through because of that execute. It also helps you jump into the back line. You need a gap closing to make sure that Hebo can't get away. Cool, you're going to be able to lock him down. Okay, so Poseidon picked up for United here. We've seen Scream run it a couple of times. Could still go towards the mid lane, though. Without all being banned, normally when you see a, a jungle mage, you normally see a haunted mid lane. But we've seen a bit more physical there. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder if they'll go for the all pick or see what the selections are first, I guess, from Sanguine. And with Thor being available again for Sanguine, no surprises <laughs> to see Panitom go back there. 
E United, you can tell they've conditioned us pretty well, because I see that Poseidon, my first thought is, oh, okay, Scream's going to be playing it. And it's, you should never immediately think of a jungler when you see Poseidon, but it's just, again, something that is wholly unique to them. They strip away genetics, having that Terra. Granted, he's going to be playing the Ganesh this time around. If Sanguine can maybe get that off to a better roll than we got to see out of what you know genetics was able to accomplish, I think this Terra can find a good home. It's good healing. It's good setup. But I think a lot is riding on King Arthur, how Yarkor makes those rotations late game. And once again, it's Panatom's Thor maybe being kind of the center of attention. It will be Circuit more than likely for the jungle. Then obviously with a Ganesha and a Poseidon, I don't see any other real way unless you're putting Circuit solo against a King Arthur. <laughs> Not this time around, my friends. I don't think so at all. I will say, I think United are still struggling with identity issues. They just don't know what they want to do as a team. Because, once again, I, I don't see a ridiculous amount of synergy from this composition. Plenty of slows, I would say. And we'll see if this execute can come through from Achilles, though, on Variety. What do you reckon? We're going to a game three here, Gore? I don't know. If Sanguine, like you said, with a lot of slows there, I feel like a couple of Witchblades come online in late game. They don't have too much that's locking them down. The Kraken, the lane phase should be good. If e United can start this ramp off really well, get ahead early and hold on to it, then they'll have control. Well, let's find out what the casters have to say. Sanguine, one game away from being e United. And looking pretty good doing it. Thanks, Hindu Man and Gormizer. Still Finch and Mifflin here on the call as we move into the second game here of this set. Early spot on this Sunder here for genetics on the Ganesh. That's always something to try and keep your eyes on. But another thing to be worried about, man, Panatom back on the Thor. But Shinto isn't on a Raijin or a Merlin this time, Mifflin. He's on the Hebo. Yeah, they showed some respect e United, that is, in the Game 1 ban phase. Game 2, they, they let go of all semblance of pride and ban out literally everything that Shinto is known for. Raijin and Merlin taken away in that first ban phase. That amount of respect, it's got to feel good, but it only feels good if you trust that you have the Hebo as well. I'm not certain that this truthfully fits Shinto's style. Usually you see him playing pretty far back in the engagement, throwing out his abilities and then moving up. Hebo is going to be having to get aggressive from second one. Yeah, I described it as, in an ideal world, Shinto kills you over the wall and never really looks you in the eye, right? Like, he's not necessarily like a Paul-type player, right, who's always kind of mixing it up, kind of getting in there instead. I mean, we saw it last game. They like to protect Shinto and Naturoid. They kind of will let Shinto farm a little bit more selfishly, even if it does mean that Panatom has to play from a little bit behind sometimes, because they really do trust him in the late game. To, to be their win condition. So this is a bit different for them, but I think it can still work. They've got a lot of the same great tools that helped them in game one, right? With this Terra, with this Thor in the jungle. So, so Sanguine are certainly still in a good spot. Man, look how United's dual lane is playing. That Sunder pickup might be just empowering them just a little bit. If Genetics finds <laughs> it into a knockup, the CC chain's gonna be huge, but Snoopy's the one under some duress. Yeah, Netroid jumped in aggressively. That's awesome. The moment they got some aggression, my man was ready to go, but it cost them every relic they have. Genetics with the turnaround stun forces out Beads and Shell. And Mifflin, I don't know, man. I feel like you, you use one or the other there. Do you need both defensive relics from Sanguine? I think the boys made a miscommunicated just a little bit. Beads would have been enough. Shell would have been enough. Both. Well, he's out, you know, net, net positive, he lives. <laughs> Sunder gets traded out. Now Genetics' kill potential is going to go down quite a bit. Look at Scream, man. This is crazy. L leave my man Panatom alone on his back camps. Getting caught out pretty deep. If anyone rotates on the side of Sanguine, Scream doesn't have much mobility up. But Scream able to just kind of walk out of there. I mean, Panatom used the hammer that really showed that he was committed to that engagement. And even still, Scream didn't want to stick around. Unwelcome. The good news, though, is that he has plenty of information, right? Snoopy and Genetics know that they've got Rongyu and Netroid pinned on the left-hand side, so Scream is free to rotate over, blinks over the wall, Cobra Kiss, and Netroid comes back in. What a homie. In fact, they're winning the 2v3. They get some backup coming in from Panatom to turn the fight around. That's first blood, and they want a bit more as Genetics tries to hide in the minions, but he cannot. Netroid gets the kill, and it's a two for zero. Netroid doesn't need anybody to help him. Dodges the, the, the Cobra's kiss with his <laughs> jump. Dunks back down. Hits all three with a dunk. Shoots the wall. Finds a double bounce on a two targets as well. Good luck invading this man's purple buff. That was immaculate play to stop all the aggression from United. United wholly favored in that fight. They had the jump on the game. Yeah. They got the blink off before anyone was even really aware that Sir Cat was going to be coming into that purple buff. Doesn't matter though. Netroid turns it on his head. 
I don't imagine we see United step up that far again for at least another five minutes. No, that's the kind of thing that you're still thinking about later on in the game, right? I mean, that is, that's pretty crazy that someone came out on top in that engagement. And it's so interesting because I think that United had, as you mentioned, a lot of things that made them think that fight was going to go well. I mean, sure, they, Pantom had the information that Scream was there in the jungle, but you don't necessarily think that he sticks around for another 10 seconds or so doing nothing, waiting on purple, and, and, and still saying when we're ready for it, they were able to respond. And that trust we mentioned earlier, I love Net coming back down into that fight and wrong you and Panatom being there to back him up. That's a huge turnaround play that that, that Sanguine are able to make. I, I just can't My dude didn't have beads. The shell was down. He dunked into three <laughs> they people. Used all That's their insane to think about it. They didn't, he didn't care. He was going for damage and he finds it. If I'm Scream, I'm laying in bed awake tonight thinking about it, staring at the ceiling like, that man jumped on all three of us and then double bounced all of us? Like, that's crazy. Uh, people like to say the Netro is a Jingwei one trick, but man, yeah. this Hui is so absolutely dominant. Uh, Genetics has got to be feeling bad as well. He goes the aggressive relic inside of this Sunder. Doesn't have Shell available to help out his squad there. Doesn't have Heavenly. Sunder was down, no kill potential. I mean, that's just, that's a perfect storm for Sanguine. It is, and we know that Sanguine are the kind of squad that can capitalize on this. I think it is also worth mentioning how important it is that Netroid plays well, but they've got some trouble. They're trying to use the Hurlwind combo along with this Circuit to get the kill, but instead it's Scream who ends up low. Does manage to jump back, but Panatom manages to find the kill. Shinto hunts down Hurlwind as well. Another two for zero on the back of E United, starting off a good fight. Man, I just gotta, I just gotta laugh about it a little bit, man. E United getting a little bit stubborn, immediately going back to the scene of the crime and allowing it to happen to him yet again. <laughs> Netrioid is absolutely on fire. Scream's gotta be pulling his hair out at this point. Shift your focus, man. Leave Netrioid alone. Every time you go over there, E United are just giving them extra farm at this point. They're not stealing the buff. They're not getting kills. They're trading relics, sure, but they're losing their life in the process. Netrioid is not even really the true ideal target of aggression on the side of Sanguine. This Hebo's been free farming the entire time, and he's already established yeah. a lead. Now he's level 8 to hurry wins level 7. So often you have to worry about Shinto finding tons of extra farm, even in a world when you are applying pressure. But in this game, when they've so clearly been over in left, he's been really free to kind of do whatever he wants. And it hurts that Hurlwind rotates over there and they cannot find that gank. I mean, Sir Ket, Cobra's Kiss into Kraken. That should be a successful gank every time when you start the fight off that way. But Sengwin continue to find these responses and mitigate United's aggression. I like that they're trying to play this early game active, but Sengwin have just had all the answers. 2,000 gold in the lead. You got to shift your focus now if you're United. That that purple buff defense is ironclad. Time to start putting some pressure on Clearly. Ashito. Maybe maybe gank out Yarkor. I mean, ganking a, a King Arthur almost never going to work, but clearly ganking this Huyi isn't working at all. Rongyu uses his shell fantastically in that engagement to survive through the Kraken, reposition himself, and allow Netroid to follow up on the damage. I mean... It's just a clean defense, maybe a little bit iffy on the offense from E United. They don't have the damage stack. Snoopy's not in range to follow up. So it's essentially a 2v2 between Netrioid and Rongyu versus Scream and Hurrywin. And again, it's just not working out. Metroid perhaps getting aggressive again on Snoopy, nearly finds the solo kill. Die bomb is enough, and this game too belongs to Metroid right now. 3-0-2 oh, and, and having an absolute game for himself up against Snoopy and the rest of E-Unite on that left-hand side of the map, man. I don't even know if I want to send Snoopy back there. Metroid just feeling it right now. <laughs> Yeah, leave the lane. You lost. That lane's <laughs> over. Leave Netrioid alone. My man's popping off. That wasn't even an easy double bounce. And he, and he telegraphed it immensely. He threw out the ultimate, spent three seconds lining up the bounce. Snoopy says, oh, word, you're going to do it. Bet you miss. Netrioid doesn't miss those. Still... He lands it. Yeah. I mean, Snoopy, bro, put some respect on this man. Sit inside your tower. Call for help. Whatever you want to do. But Netrioid's looking unstoppable. Maybe there's a respect allotment, right? They, they gave so much to Shinto and the picks and bands. No way they can acquiesce to Netroid and left as well. But at this point in the game, I think you kind of have to. It's Sanguine now, considering a red buff invade, good Whirlpool and the Kraken, all in the name of securing the buff, and they still do not even get it. It's Sanguine that strip it away. Dharmic Pillars from Genetics to try and catch Shinto on the tail end, especially with Scream nearby. But the oh. knockup is there into the crushing wave. Scream lucky to survive as Sanguine get away with yet another invade. 
sanguine, man. Everything that could possibly go right is going right. Everything that could possibly go wrong is going wrong for EU United. Uh, things are looking rough. Shinto's been uncontested. He's farming freely. Now level 10 already. Hurry when uses his Kraken to confirm a red buff. Not a Gold Fury, not a Pyromancer, not Fire Giant, not a kill. And he still can't even get his own buff there. I mean... You gotta feel bad for the boys in red right now. What's their way in? They're slowly bleeding out across the map. Now, 2,000 gold in favor of Sanguine. The level disparity is starting to make itself evident. The only one in the game for United who's really got any sort of lead is Variety. And he's been left alone on an island. And you're not gonna kill Yarkor on your own. No, it's gonna be really difficult to try and take down a King Arthur by himself. And, you know, you gotta wonder, you said earlier, it might be time for an adjustment in terms of where their aggression is. But I think that's why it's so well timed for Sanguine for themselves to get aggressive. You no longer allow United to decide where the fights happen. Instead, you take the fight to them around red and try and force United to force an awkward engagement. The Darmek pillars to slow down Shinto and give Scream a chance to move in with that Blink Serket engage. I, I, the idea made sense, but it just didn't work. Panic Tom in some trouble now. A great silence buys them some time, but disjointed. The Kraken needs to be there sooner. It's not enough. Panatom even turns around to put the hammer into Scream's back. That sets up for Yarkor to get the kill. Stun lands onto Variety. Has to use Fatal Strike just to escape at this point. But United, man, they're, they're on different pages at this point. Uh, uh, now Variety caught out as well. Genetics likely going to die here. S Sanguine, go to Gold Fury. Go to Fire. I don't care. Do whatever you want. You own the map. If I thought Scream was inting earlier when he decided to go back into God King Netroid's lane and die to him for the second time in a full minute, he's certainly inting there on that back camp when he decides to ult the minion instead. It's got to be a slight misplay, maybe just a misclick, but certainly, that's it, not what you want. It's not what you want at all. Kraken finds its way home, but the dot damage from Circa's ultimate finds nothing except for a back camp steal, so invade successful for E United, but... The slash line is so indicative. The gold lead is so indicative of how this game is rolling out. And Sanguine hasn't chosen a single one of these fights. It's constantly just E United walking in their jungle and getting crushed by the defense of Sanguine. Sanguine have always been really good at responding. That's it's part of why they can go late. But United now making a desperation play here, Mifflin. This could work. Fire Giant being pulled 10 and a half minutes into the game. But Yarkor is nearby. If he knows about this, maybe he could stop he him. But Yarkor's no going to wave. Well, I don't he knows think he recognizes it. Now the Genix has died to FG. He has to know. Damage coming from over the wall. But it is secured by the Kraken. E United had to make something happen. And they find an early 11 minute FG. That's a huge power play for them. Maybe now they can win some team fights themselves. Panatom goes a little bit too deep. Scram finds the kill. Yarkor in the back end. Not quite enough to deal any damage there. Rongyu is not going to deal enough. Four members strong with Fire Giant. E United have the power play. I equate it to 10,000 gold, but the dive continues. Variety, are you okay? No, it looks like he's not. Ends up getting grabbed for Camelot and Avalon as they bring him back down. And all the while, tanking up this tier one tower. Wrong you has not a care in this world. Knock up from Shinto as he joins the fray. Crushing wave is enough to get that kill onto Scream. And they finally bring down the tier one tower. And Yarkor on 10% HP still aggressive. But Genetics wants the kill, makes Wrong you pay. But that leaves Shinto in the back line with Hurwin so far winning the 1v1. But even Snoopy rotates over. They shut down Yarkor core so now you must ask where is netroid well he is still pushing the tier two tower in left as shinto collects yet another kill don't step up snoopy that man just hit him for 802 abilities be careful bro oh no <laughs> snoopy what's going on man shinto's styling what is this lazy bag panatom's coming out on the tail end snoopy rest in peace dog yeah there's just not much way for him to get out at this point panatom gets the kill and myth Talk to me a little bit about this. I mean, I like the play, obviously, to go for that fire giant and try and make something miraculous happen because the momentum was in Sanguine's way in a huge way this game. It was feeling brutal. Talk to me about how that all kind of fell apart for him. Uh, it fell apart the second that they decided to stick the engagement. They re-engage on a Panatom. They do find the pick, but they don't realize that a level 14 Shinto on Hebo is able to literally three-shot anyone that walks up to him. He wins multiple 1v1 engagements because all of the aggression was focused towards Yarkor. All of the aggression was on Rongyu. Panatom does die, but the entire time Shinto gets left unchecked. He finds so much damage on the tail end, and E United, almost like Lemmings, going one at a time trying to stop him. Shinto not really going to be worried about any of that. His damage output is absolutely gnarly at this point. 
Fire Giant is taken by E United. All that does is slow down Sanguine. I don't even think they were thinking about Fire Giant at that point. They don't nope. want it. They don't care. And now only one member left with it, Hurry Wind at level 12. I mean, that's not enough. You're, it's not a lead anymore. Your Fire Giant might as well not exist. Hurry Wind just got himself a slight red buff and a blue buff to go with him. Yeah, you barely got to finish your fight, Fire Giant spiel about how valuable it is before Sanguine had taken it off just about everyone, huh? And United did lose a member to the Fire Giant too, and I think that's worth mentioning. I don't think Sanguine recognized it until someone showed up in the kill feed dying to that objective. If they could have kept everyone alive for that one, maybe they get out of there a bit more cleanly on the back end. A scream tries to get aggressive, immediately gets caught by the hammer and dies to Netroid. So Herwin's got to find something, but it's a double kill now for the Ho Yi. His rampage from earlier on continues. Beads and Aegis, so we can keep right on fire. And dive bomb back down and he gets the triple off the ricochet netroid will not be denied at this point in the game genetics at that point there was nothing he could do he falls as well a four for zero for sanguine man i was just thinking to myself man netroid hasn't done much recently since they stopped going to his lane and that's exactly what it was united show even a little bit of presence on the gold three side of the map netroid says oh you forgot what happened at two minutes i'll do it again and the team response is so good there panatom trusting his boy at a quarter health no mana he decides to dunk in and create space so that netroid can take the fight at his own leisure i mean these sanguine boys are playing around each other incredibly well the defense is strong their offense is equally strong these guys are looking untouchable Variety tried to look for the flank on the backside of the fight, but he basically just gave his life away. He died before the flank could be completed. Now, Sanguin will try and take this favorable 4v4 fight. They don't quite have Panatom here for it, but the fight's not really there either. They choose to fall back on the back of it. And this is this is scary, man, for everyone out there. Sanguin have the potential, I think, to look this good on any given game. 12k experience, 8,600 gold. United now at this point, Myth, they need they need Sanguine to step out of line two to three times back to back. Uh, maybe Netroid DC's here. That's United's way back in, man. 8,000 gold, 1,200 experience, and the timer on the game is 15 minutes. Scream, a little bit right, far up so here, but he's one of the most mobile gods in the game. Should be all right. The way in for United, cheeky group up, five-man stack in your jungle, pray that maybe Panatom walks in alone. Go some weird ganks on the back camps. You gotta do something to stop the bleed. It's opening up United towards some more losses here, but you have to risk it at this point. I mean, 10,000 gold so early on, you just gotta go for heroic plays back to back. They do all in this Pyromancer. Hurwind, Whirlpool, Krakens, Panatom doesn't get a ton of damage, but makes it pretty hard for Panatom to come up and contest that Pyro. So at the very least, E United have gotten something. And you can tell now they've started to really buckle down and just try and force stuff. I don't think they're going to get any more good options the rest of the game unless Sanguine just makes a bunch of mistakes. So they have to keep doing what they're doing here, Mip, which is just try and force something. As Sanguine now started to posture around the FG. They're going to have to kill Shinto, but who's going to dive Shinto? Variety has nearly no magical defense online. Genetics is so squishy at this point that uh, a 1-3-1 one, one from Shinto is going to put him in the dirt. When your priority target to kill on the enemy team is so far ahead and so potent, I mean, it, it's just an unrealistic task at this point to stop Shinto's rampage. It's going to be difficult. Panatom did take to the sky, lands back towards Hurrowin. Fire Giant low, and Sanguine confirm it, even with Variety poking his head in. Yarkor gets the kill onto Genetics as well, as Panatom forces Hurrowin out of the engagement. Metroid going up and over the wall. They really want this wow. kill, but they do not even need him. The hammer double tap gets the job done. At this point, Sanguine, with five members strong and no towers left in mid, really can just start threatening a Phoenix. Man, I really thought it was going to be Enhanced Fire Giant, but I have to remind myself that we're only 17 <laughs> minutes into this game. Snoopy trying to get a Phoenix in return. It's the best play he can make because he's not stopping the aggression. But You're gonna Sanguine going for a pre-20? That's what it looks like. They want to try and put the game to bed, but that's great damage from Variety on the back line to bring Shinto low. Yarkor gets the kill. They head right back to the Titan. Sanguine feeling themselves at this point as they turn around and pop Scream as well. Potentially the fastest game we could have here if they find a way to get the end because Netroid is still full HP and just swinging on the Titan. Nothing that E United could do. Three 18 minutes. Sanguine, take care of this one easy. Uh, uh... Yeah, man, United played well. Sanguine real good. 
you show so much respect for the first time, I think, towards Sanguins in the P's and B's. We see Raijin, Merlin, banned out, Jingwei taken away. That's all the answers that I thought I had for Sanguin. That's all the answers I see in Twitch chat, Mixer chat. They're all, just ban out the Merlin. Shinto can't do anything else. What, dude? I mean, it's almost like they unveiled a, a, a secret form that we didn't know of about Sanguin. You, you stripped away that surface level layer of just the Raijin, Merlin, Jingwei, and you unveiled the beast mode that we just saw. That was a uniquely punishing game, though, for E United. Those back-to-back -back ganks not working set them almost irrecoverably behind. That's not going to happen every time when you're up against Sanguine, but they absolutely capitalized here. A really dominant 2-0 win for the Sanguine boys. Congrats to them. We'll get it back over to the desk, though, and let them break it down a bit further. What do you say, production? What? Oh, oh, oh. Well, welcome back. Um, that kind of ended quicker than I expected to there. Uh, Sanguin, go, go help me out. What happened? Like, United were playing one second and the next second it was over? I'm trying to, I'm in an arena here, dude. I don't, I don't even know if, I don't know if United ever started playing. I mean, there was like a moment in the middle, technically, that they came up and it was literally the middle. I mean, at 10 minutes, there's that fire giant. I don't know if you remember that. This was like... Well, I'm just going to read what I wrote down. This is a smite game on crack. It went so fast-paced compared to what we see in the SBL that it just felt like they compressed a 45-minute game into 18. Yeah. A couple of fights in the early game, and that was pretty much all she wrote. You saw United oh. trying to scramble to get back into it, but this is ridiculous with what happened there. Even I just fell apart at the seams, it felt like, after, as Finch said, you know, two failed ganks in the dual lane, Netroid did Netroid things with support, of course, from Panitama and Wrong Yu. And uh, yeah, Sanguin gave as good as they got and then answered back yeah. in folds. I did like the call from United at the 10 minute mark, though, about the FG, if I'm honest. I think that call yeah, was a I good idea it. to try and get back in the game, right? But was it enough? I mean, I think the, the idea behind it is probably one of the best executions of absolutely what you said. Hey, what do we do to get back into this? The only thing we can do at a 5k gold deficit at 10 minutes is try to sneak a fire giant. And no one does it at 10 minutes, so maybe we can do it. And yet Variety, or sorry, Yarkor, I'm sorry, was still almost able to get over there. If that Nearly. kill on genetics had happened like a smidge earlier, you might have even seen Sanguine come in for a steal, but that was about the extent of it. Other than that, I mean, Ian and I didn't get that FG. They did make a, a monumentous achievement in getting Ganesh a kill, which is, is huge. And they give us a roller coaster of a game, but but that was Sanguine from minute zero all the way to 1759 on the achievement. Absolutely brutal for United to go against. And honestly, from a fan's point of view and from, you know, a spectator's point of view, United are slowly slipping further and further down the table. That performance, sure, Sanguine's a really good team. But last time they faced off against each other, you know, earlier on in the season, that was a 2-1 matchup. It was a decimation. Great performance from Sanguine, honestly. Jeez. Uh, my mind is on, like, you know, I, when we saw Fire Giants, that would happen at 18 minutes, I considered that a fast game, right? That's a fast pace. Someone's really in control there. They just set two new records, I think, for the SPL. And the 10-minute FG right there for E United, at least for this season. And, of course, I mean, 17.59 for that one. I feel, I said if E United got early game control, then maybe they could keep saying one down. But they, they never got to, to even start the early game there. And I will say, I think picks and bans for United surely made adjustments, but not good enough. That climbs Sanguine back up to eight and four in the standings now. So there's currently clear second place for them. Whereas the United slipped down below Renegades and that seventh and eighth seed, they do not make the playoff land at the mid season. So E United really have their work cut out now with less than two weeks to go. And they're going to have to hope for results elsewhere with how that's played. Luckily enough, Renegades do have a game in hand. So if they lose that, they would still be tied up, but it makes it pretty tricky. We do have Finch though, standing by with a member of the Sanguine team to break down, well, what we just saw in that game. Cause I didn't get time to catch it. I'm going back to my arena game anyway. <laughs> Thanks, Hindu and Gore on the desk. I do indeed have Netroid here. And, and Netroid, I mean, uh, do you have anything to say to the people who consider you a Jingwei one trick or something like that? What a performance in that game too, my man. Yeah, it was an absolutely great performance by us. Uh, we were kind of like, as soon as we killed 
three of them or two of them at dual lane. At three minutes, I think, we were like, oh my god, what are they doing? <laughs> so, <laughs> we were like, okay, just keep playing and let's hit a new record, I think. <laughs> Yeah, pre-18 minutes might be one of the fastest Titan kills on record here for us. Talk to me a little bit about that Fire Giant that E and I did in the second game as well. Did you all have any idea they were doing it before that kill notification came in? Or, or what were the comms like in that moment? Yeah, actually I was like, oh, there's something weird here. And as soon as I said they are on fire 100%, Genetics died to the Fire Giant. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, that's why Jarkor went in and... We kind of tried to steal it, but we couldn't. That was a great call by them, to be honest. I think it was too. I think in a world where, you know, maybe things are a little bit cleaner on the back end, they might get away with that FG. Well, this is still a really impressive season here for you all. And you all continually, I think, prove your doubters wrong on the actual battleground. Do you all get motivated at all by, by some of the, the stuff that you all hear about Sanguine? Or, or are you all just locked in and focused on your games? Uh, we are always locked in and focused on our games because we think, okay, this is a new match, this is a new team, so we have to play our game and after that we can like celebrate or keep motivated, so that's how we usually think. Okay, last thing, they ban the Merlin away from him, they ban the Raijin, he goes down to the Hebo. At this point, is there anything you think Shinto might not be able to play at a really high level? Uh, I think Shinto has a lot of like gods, he, he has a good god pool. Uh, I think I kind of have to work on my god pool, I think, because I kind of, you know, locked in Sernunus. I think I did well with that god, but still. So I don't think they can easily ban Shinto, but who knows? <laughs> Might be a harder thing to accomplish than it seems. Appreciate you taking some time to talk with me there, Netrio. And great to watch you all play, and good luck in your next match. We have a quick break coming up, though, but we have plenty more SPL action coming up for that second set. Thank you.